Good afternoon. Hello. And welcome to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Uh, my name is Tom Sharpley, and I'm the museum manager. And, oh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, m and Bank, North Country Federal Credit Union, and AARP Vermont, who sponsor our free Sunday lecture series. Thank you very much today. Yay. Okay, here's the calendar of events that are happening. And so much is happening, this is going to take a while. If you don't need to take notes, we printed out some, some sheets that have all this information on them, if you want to pick one up on your way out. All right, July 26th is Friday. Oh, we're so excited about Friday. I can't even stand it. We're having the VIP premiere party for our new movie about uh, Fanny Allen Penn. And so far, 80 people have RSVP, and we kind of fit them all in this room. I don't know how we're going to do it. Uh, I've been telling people, I probably shouldn't say this, I've been telling people, if you really want to help with the premiere, stay home. <laughs> uh, all right. Then July 27th and 28th is uh, Fanny Allen Penniman weekend. And we are going to have a uh, Fanny Allen Penniman um, um, reenactor here. And... Uh, She's going to give a little speech in front of the before the movie showings. We show the move. We show the movies five times a day, but the two movies five times a day. But during this weekend, we're just showing the Fanny Allen Penny movie five times with a little speech beforehand. And here's the big here's the big news: Vermont residents are all free on on next Saturday and next Sunday. So if you're a Vermont resident, bring your ID because we won't believe you otherwise, and uh, you get it free. All right. August 11th is the Homestead Book Club. We're discussing the book John Adams Under Fire. And that is from 3 to 4 on August the 11th. August 17th is one of our home and hearth reenactments. Learn about everyday living in the 1780s on the Vermont frontier from an experienced reenactor. We did that yesterday. It was great. Then we have on August 18th our free month monthly lecture is Vermont Milk Chocolate Company Factory, Hope, Setbacks, and Perseverance by Dr. Thomas Durant Visser, Professor of History at the University of Vermont. And then August 24th, oh, I'm just learning about this. I'm leading this program, so I better, I better get on the stick. From 11 to 2.30 p.m., we're harvesting the flax. Actually, we're probably harvesting the flax a little before that, but we'll ripple the flax instead. We're playing with flax. Come and play with flax. We're the only museum in Vermont that makes linen out of flax. And we're very proud of that fact. And so come play with flax on August the 24th. All right. Now I'd like to introduce the guy who's going to introduce the speaker. And his name is Glenn Fay. He's a member of the board here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And uh, he's the author of several books that we sell in the gift shop. And I'll, I'll, leave, it to, I'll leave it to Glenn. Welcome. Gary Shattuck is a New Hampshire native who graduated from the University of Colorado, the Vermont Law School, and the American Military University. He served more than three decades in law enforcement as a deputy sheriff in Boulder, Colorado, a patrol commander with the Vermont State Police, and as an assistant attorney general prosecuting Vermont uh, Drug Task Force cases. Gary went on to become an assistant United States attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice, where he served as an organized crime prosecutor, as Vermont's anti-terrorism coordinator, and then overseas as a legal advisor to governments in Kosovo and Iraq. He has received many awards for his work, including from U.S. Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez for his efforts in Iraq standing up that country's legal system after the invasion of 2003. Since leaving government service, Gary has written six books and many articles on early Vermont history. As a fellow his historian, I have admired Gary for his keen legal perspective and his context of the Allens. I approached Gary a couple of years ago to get his opinion on some of the complexities of what I found. Historians tend to be generous 
and Gary has been magnanimous and open up groundbreaking perspectives on the Allen family. He has shared hundreds of legal files, probably thousands, um, with me alone, and found in obscure places, offered road trips to the National Archives, brought other historians together, and is truly one in a million. We couldn't be happier to have Gary Shattuck share his timely research today. back from Homestead. I was here several years ago and uh, despite John's request to come back, I had resisted but I couldn't when I got to this point. Um, the purpose of today is to kind of tie together a lot of the research I was doing in the uh, 19th century. Um, and I started out in 1800 having to do with the Black Snake Affair, which you know about here, those of you that are familiar. wrote that book. And then researching further, going into the into the century about uh, drug-related things, because that's my that's the work I've done for 30 years is drug enforcement and uh, chasing the bad guys. And the thing that rose the, that rose in my mind, the major question was if drugs and substance abuse and abortion are so important today. Certainly, it couldn't have been any different back in the 1800s. So I went back and looked at that. And it turns out, you know, Vermont had its first opium epidemic by 1900, but we'll get to that. I thought that this was kind of like a screenshot of what society was like along the eastern seaboard in 1820. <laughs> it's a magnificent uh, painting by Rembrandt Peale. It's 23 by 12 feet tall. It's very huge. It was taken apart and assembled at various venues up and down the, uh, the east coast. Thousands of people came to see it. And it's uh, just obviously death in the middle. And uh, people were fascinated by the different things that he brought together with regard to death. You see war over here on the right. You see uh, old age, infirmity on, to the right of death. You see a dead young man on the bottom. But the, the thing I want to draw your attention to that I found interesting was kneeling at the, mm -hmm. on the left side of death there is um, pleasure. Mm -hmm. And pleasure has... Uh, a grill of some kind, and you see a mist coming up from where it is she's cooking. And we'll talk about what those things might be, those substances that uh, pleasure is offering. And standing above pleasure is temperance with her arm over her head, and temperance, of course, is take everything in moderation. And if you don't, then you suffer suicide, which the man next, just behind, uh, temperance is stabbing himself, and then uh, lying down on the ground with his hands up to his head is delirium tremors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're looking at uh, alcohol, we're looking at war. We're not talking about opium yet because it really hasn't hit the stage yet, but we're going to move on to it. But I just thought this was interesting because uh, Peel kind of identified, encapsulated the, the major problems that society was facing. We're going to talk about uh, drunkards, opium eaters, uh, family planning, also known as abortionists, okay? That's just a, a, a nice way of saying it. We're not going to talk about the other trinity, part of the trinity. There's alcohol, opium, and tobacco. Those were the three things in the 1800s. We're not going to talk about it. Uh, I think the, we got enough to deal with there. We're not going to talk about the deaths of so many Vermont women by consumption, tuberculosis. That was very well covered in the literature. Many, many, many uh, women, for some reason, I haven't seen a reason for it, died disproportionately because of TB. We're going to talk about uh, the physician infighting, the drug trade, addiction rates. Uh, this is just very quickly, uh, Google has an interesting tool called an engram viewer. And you can plug in a term, and you can plug in the year when you want to look at a particular term. And what it does is it takes all the literature that there is that Google can search. And if you plug in something like alcohol or opium or abortion, you can see that from the time just after the revolution, how these particular topics gained in popularity. And if you want to pick, identify a particular decade, there's a, you can click down below the, the Engram viewer and it will zero in on what documents 
will support where this is. But what you can see is alcohol is, predict, is the predominant substance we're going to be talking about. Opium keeps kind of a, a flat level, except around 1840, this is when the uh, opium wars are going on with China and England. So it gets a lot of publicity, it's written about, so you see it more in the, in the uh, literature. Abortion is kind of a flat line, essentially, throughout the uh, century. It's not really highly written about. Uh, and you could put addiction, which also I didn't put it on here, but it's essentially a flat line also. So the top line, I missed it when this person I'm sorry? The top line is alcohol? Uh, yeah, alcohol, right, so is the top alcohol. one. Okay. And then opium, and then abortion. Okay. And what's the, the scope of this in the United States, Vermont? Or? This is what the literature, no, it's not Vermont, it's the literature that oh. Google has available to it. You put the term so in it, worldwide and it does, it, you'll have to take a look at it. I guess it depends on the term. But you can put Napoleon in there, you're probably going to get a lot of you know, European yeah, thing. But what's fascinating is because it will cite you to the primary documents back in 1700, 1800, that will support uh, the particular document. Uh, the question is going to be, um, as we go through the 19th century, how much legislative action there's going to be by the Vermont legislature. And I can tell you it's pretty much nothing. They took great pride in passing very few laws to inhibit the uh, freedom of Vermonters. So it's, it's pretty much was the Wild West. And you take a look at the laws of 1894 that were passed. Prohibition, which went into effect in uh, 1852, there are 23 pages of laws, 111 sections. Contrast that with drugs and abortion. Each of those topics consists of uh, less than a page and with three sections each for each one of those topics. So the main focus in the law throughout the 19th century happened to be uh, alcohol. And we suffer for it because the opium is kind of at a, a lower level and it percolates and goes until the, the uh, epidemic of 1900. The, one of the most important organizations was the Vermont Temperance Society, which focused on alcohol. But temperance made a distinction between fermented uh, substances like beer and wine and distilled like rum and whiskey. And you can see one is natural, one is man, man has, has man's intervention in it. Opium is natural without man's intervention. So it received lesser attention in the temperance movement. They were going after distilled uh, substances. The other thing that's not talked about here is adulteration. The drug dealers today will do what's called stepping on it. They'll step on the drugs. And that means you take an ounce of cocaine, you take an ounce of inositol, you mix them together and you get two ounces. It, it dilutes the cocaine, but it increases the volume available to sell. You see what's going on with fentanyl, which is a, was a cutting agent, but now it's become so potent, it's become a drug uh, of getting it in its own attention. We'll start with alcohol. Uh, it begins literally uh, at the founding. Uh, well, I guess it could be close to, you could call it the founding, with Ethan Allen and uh, Benedict Arnold storming Fort Ty and discovering 60 casts of distilled uh, uh, alcohol in the bottom of Fort Ticonderoga and uh, immediately getting polluted on it. <laughs> and eventually, uh, at one point, tried to kill um, Benedict Arnold. That's 75. In 1778, the Council of Safety begins to take on uh, the problem and starts to regulate alcohol in taverns. By uh, 18, or 1787, we have a General Assembly um, beginning to form. This is from the Vermont Historical Society on the left. It's just a book with all the alcohol that all the legislators were consuming. <laughs> a few months ago, I went to the National Archives and looked up Thomas Chitton. I'll show you why. It turns out you know, I wrote an article for it. It's in the Vermont Bar Association Journal of the spring. He was the only governor to be convicted of a federal offense involving alcohol uh, in the state's history. And we didn't know that until we came across this. United States versus Thomas Chittenden. This is also from the National Archives, and this just gives you a flavor of what life was like, at least in the courts, uh, after statehood when federal law began to be imposed. This is just a, 
a listing, just a sampling from 1787 to 17, uh, 1797 to 98. And all it is is just a list of all the selling spirits without license. These are just nothing but criminal prosecutions going on. And the fourth name down from the top is Thomas Chipman. Okay. <laughs> it's just, uh, what, the point I want to drive home is that alcohol is, was very, very important in the early days of Vermont. And then we move into the 1800s. And, uh, uh, in 1800, there were 481 licensed taverns in Vermont. This is just a representative sample of 102 of them in Windsor County. This comes from the uh, state archives. Put this into perspective, in 1811, there are 125 distilleries in Vermont producing 173,000 gallons of spirits to a population of which 51% of uh, 51 were 16 and under. <laughs> so the consumption was wide and it was across the professions, it was across the various age limits. Farm workers, militiamen, ministers were downing it before sermons. Uh, parents were giving it to their children to quiet them. Okay. Now, it's important to understand also uh, the, adul the adulteration problem here of stepping, what I said, stepping on it. That involved using, thing, if you step on a drug, adulterate it, you've cut the effectiveness of it. So you've got to add something into it to keep it flavorable. So they would add flavorings and spices and things like that. They would also have opium and ergot. Ergot, we'll talk about it in a minute because that's also an abortion drug. But it's terribly, uh, it was terribly uh, effective in uh, making the distilled drugs much more unfavorable from a societal point of view because that's what brought in all the violent conduct by people who were downing it on Saturday, on Friday, Saturday night down at the local tavern and raising hell on the streets, pissing off all of the temperance people which, who were pushing ahead with the legislature to pass the laws. Now, opium, like I said, is a natural product, not, not artificially altered, like, unlike uh, distillation. It's not disruptive. It's used silently. It's effective. It's a wonderful, wonderful drug from a medical standpoint. It's the abuse that causes the problem. It's 9% morphine which was uh, beginning to, they were distilling it out of opium uh, in the early 1800s. And it's used to quell fevers, DTs, control insanity. People resort, resorted to it for suicides. You read the Vermont newspaper uh, going back to that time and there were lots of suicides by taking opium. There were overdoses, and though it doesn't talk about it much, if you look closely enough, there were murders that were committed, uh, uh, unwanted children, uh, the infirm, the insane, living in the remote regions of Vermont, uh, people that were consuming goods that were not really uh, available to them. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. But to give you an idea, this is a 1785 um, uh, general store advertisement in Bennington. And he's got all kinds of opium. He's got all kinds of opium derivatives. He's got patent medicines available. This is without licensing for the people. It's open to uh, anybody who wants to walk through the doors. They can pick this stuff up. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, opium that is being sold is coming from, uh, at this time, before we get to uh, India and uh, China, in the early 1800s, is coming from um, Turkey and Smyrna, Constantinople, from that general area. But then we're going to move into East India uh, by the 1840s, where the British are involved with the Chinese, and the opium wars take place. Locals were growing opium in their gardens here in Vermont. Now we begin to take off thanks to uh, an Englishman named uh, uh, Thomas de Quincy, who in 1822 wrote Confessions of an English Opium Eater, and he revels in his uh, drunkenness, if you will, his highness uh, of using opium in England and what, what it did for him. And uh, he was an escapist uh, who just drugged himself throughout his life, but managed to survive and write this, this uh, book. It becomes more and more popular after 1820, which is the year of the Rembrandt Peel, 
that did this uh, painting. Uh, there's, a, there's a great quote from 1841. One doctor is talking to a local medical society. He says, people, you just have to understand, the wine goes to the gentleman and the opium goes to the ladies. So they were already beginning to branch off and the women are, are using more opium than the men, apparently. In 1840, uh, it's, been, it's been coming in, but in 1840, uh, customs officials along the coast are surprised when suddenly 24,000 pounds uh, opium arrives on a ship. By 1898, that is up to uh, over half a million pounds, 565,000. I won't bore you with the, with the figures here. The bottom line is, in the 1840s, the per capita use of opium was 2 aspirin. By the 1890s, it was 10 aspirin. You convert this using the population here in Vermont. That remains, means that by 18, early 1840s, we had about 200 addicts in Vermont. By the 1890s, we had over 1,500 addicts. So it's growing. By 1900, it's estimated 16% of the uh, medical profession was addicted. That's on the na that's a nation nationwide figure. What about the children? They did. Uh, they, children didn't. You know, they didn't want to take the alcohol that their parents were feeding to them. Uh, so, or any of these medicines. So they would add flavorings to them. It was. They nurtured the children on the drugs to be used to them because it's a part of your life and you're going to take them. Um, it was, um, everybody's heard of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, mm. where you take it for the little lovelies that won't go to sleep at night, you take a little of the syrup, you give it to them, and it knocks them out. And as I said, you could use it for too much, and uh, you've got another problem. On the right, just to show you how pervasive drugs was, here's a speller uh, from, school, from some school. But it talks about things that children need to know. Lesson number two, uh, halfway down, tincture of opium. This is opium in alcohol that's been diluted. So the children are being schooled in this. They're using it at home. They're being introduced to these things. Uh, there's a really fascinating group of documents at the Vermont State Archives. It has to do with the 1857 registration. Vermont's one of the was a latecomer to registration. That's where these were the, the repository for the births, the marriages, the death. Okay, Vermont finally bought into it in 1857, but that requires the cooperation of doctors to report these things. The medical profession was very much against it and refused to do it because they weren't being paid for it. They thought it was against. They should not be forced to report these things without being paid. It had to do with uh, not town clerks, it had to do with school clerks who were creating these documents. And there's these big folios, you just flip page after page, year after year, thousands of pages, thousands of entries having to do with the deaths of children. And this is entries that are made by people that are not schooled in medicine. So this becomes terribly fascinating to see how the, the average person is going to be recording them. So you go through uh, the registration records and you see entries for uh, children deaths because of fits, convulsions, teething, sickly from birth, want of care, motherless, marasmus, which means severe undernourishment, premature birth, heart disease, measles, croup, canker rash, unknown, or simply a cause of death, infancy. 1858, a, a young female died in, in uh, Burlington from fits contracted from the mother's sedative. An unnamed 12-year-old uh, boy in Brandon died from too much paragoric, another opium-based uh, drug. Uh, Marianne Dor Doherty in Rutland died because she was fed on spirits. Lilla Sanger died because she, quote, smothered in bed, accidental. Uh, here's a female who died by birth. A reason for death? Illegitimate. <laughs> and here's an interesting, it's an interesting comment on the state of uh, our society, the makeup of our society. Here's a, a young child, uh, and these are people, that, these are children that are dying, infants dying just days after birth. Female, of Negro origin on the mother's side. Just an interesting commentary. I couldn't find more 
comments like that, but they felt it worthy enough that they would enter it into the official records. Here in Castleton, New in two infants were killed to save the mother during childbirth. And here's a very sad one, a 22-year-old woman in Chester who herself died uh, after giving birth to a stillborn daughter. And the reason for her death was, quote, caused by grief in burying her, end quote. So these are just very telling uh, statements about how uh, people were dealing with the recording of these children. Now abortion, or family planning if you want to uh, use a politically correct term, uh, was also uh, something I wanted to touch on. And it became popular because of, surprise, lack of contraception, means of contraception, and having to, to deal with women uh, who find themselves with children. But they didn't, you know, they didn't call it abortion, they called it blockages. These women that had their blockages, they needed to remove them. Under the common law, this is outside the statute, but under the common law, women are entitled to, were entitled to use or to the right to control their bodies while pregnant, except it began to get very concerning for society at the point of quickening or when the child is starting to move in the uterus. Uh, as I said, abortion is spoken of publicly. It is not a hidden topic. Uh, it's very much talked about. It's very much written about. It's in the books. It's in books that are available in Vermont bookstores if you want to see how the, the uh, process is done. And that it covers the, uh, the number of ways to uh, try and attempt it. You can start from the outside by dancing, riding horseback, lifting heavy weights, splitting wood, violent exercise, throwing yourself down the stairs, bloodletting, purges, mercury, diuretics, and electricity. Those are ways that were suggested. Or you could use ergot, which was used uh, to uh, adulterate alcohol. Now, what is that? That is the diseased ends of rye. It's a, rye, it's a fungus. And it was grown in a lot of Vermont crops. And you read the advertisements in the stores, they want farmers to bring in their ergot and to sell it to them. And it's very difficult to find out why they want that because ergot is an incredible drug. Um, it's called St. Anthony's Fire also. You probably recognize that name. Uh, at molecular, on the molecular level, it moves you into LSD, causes hallucina halluc hallucinations, paralysis. Now, how do you find out that it has that, it becomes important for abortions? Well, you look out in your field, and you look at your pregnant heifers, and they get into the field, and they eat the ergot, and immediately, it's a very quick drug, it hits the uterus, causes contractions, and these cows are expelling uh, their calves. And so the medical profession begins to latch onto that, and this becomes another process that uh, unethical doctors, I guess, if you will, would uh, feed ergot to their patients in order to, uh, to get them to move on to the, to the abortion. There's also the invasion of the body, uh, pricking the embryonic sac, if, if you happen to be a smart enough doctor able to navigate the complicated female anatomy. Um, and that is dependent upon whether you've got an, an educated doctor or an uneducated doctor, and we'll talk about that. Now, uh, there's the issue of uh, infanticide. If, you're, if you fail in your abortion, I'm sorry, some of this may be uncomfortable for some people, but these are facts of life. And there was a lot of infanticide going on, too. And in 1779, right back at the time when uh, they were looking at alcohol, uh, controlling alcohol, the, the uh, council uh, passed this first law for the punishment of murder. And it talks about, as whereas many lewd women have been delivered of bastard children to avoid their shame, to escape punishment, they will kill their child. And so they have passed the law outlawing it that if any woman is delivered of, of the issue of her body, male or female, uh, of that, you know, that would be a, be a bastard, then they, and found guilty, they were subject to murder. Uh, to uh, death, I'm sorry, not murder, but they were subject to being put to death. So this is what it was in 1779. Where was that? Is that at 
state or the local level? The what, I'm sorry? You said it the state or the local level? Well, there was no state in 79, right. but there was the, uh, the, the region, the New Hampshire grants passed by the, by the council or the committee of safety, whoever's passing the laws there. Um, so infanticide is also talked about, and it's estimated between 1820 and 1870, that uh, activity increased by women some fivefold. So as we go on, uh, abortion is getting more popular, and infanticide spikes and goes on again until the 1870s when we start to get uh, effective means of contraception. Now, next to that, I was able to find this. This is Vermont's first law on outlawing abortion in 1846. And uh, that's at the uh, State Archives in Middlesex. I was surprised to come across it. And what it does is it focuses on the women. Because we had hack doctors that were killing these women in committing and doing these abortions, that they passed the law to outlaw, to outlaw someone administering these abortions. It's not done, don't think that it's done on behalf of the fetus. This is done because they're killing the young women uh, in the population. This is a law to protect the young girl, the young ladies. This law passes, or, or, I mean, it's nothing original. It just took Vermont a while to do it, and when they did it, this is verbatim Massachusetts law at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was to, provide, to punish the providers, not the women. If the woman died, the provider would be subject to five to ten years in jail. If she lived, one to three years in jail on a $200 fine. Again, the woman is not prosecuted. Vermont stood out in that way because it was aiming for the uh, providers and not the women. But at the same time, these are paper tigers, these laws. Because if you have... In the case of drugs, if you, yeah, drugs or alcohol or abortion, if you have an enforcement mechanism, a constable uh, who's able to identify that a crime has been committed, talks to a state attorney and you can get the attention of the state's attorney to bring a charge against the provider or wh whatever the defendant may be, to institute the charge to get it into court, to get it before a jury, then you've got to get 12 jurors to agree to convict, and, and the population was not doing that. Uh, whoever, the jurors were not uh, sending these people off to jail. There are a couple of egregious situations where they did. But it's, uh, yes, it's very nice to say we had a law against abortion, but you'd have to go back and look at it very closely to see how seriously it was actually enforced. Yeah. Um, now, what's the, what's, what's the deal with the doctor-patient's relationships? Um, I told you uh, that men were drawn to wine, women to opium. The, the other distinction here is having to do with a woman and her, attack, her relationship with her physician. The doctors recognized that this was a terribly close relationship. She shared things with her physician that she would never do uh, with her husband. And so the doctors have a lot of um, suasiveness over them. And we can't get into these two cases, but I just want to mention them. They're in uh, one of the books that I wrote here, involving John McNabb of Barnett, Vermont, who Two years after Vermont passed its abortion law, got on the train and headed over to Manchester, New Hampshire, where he opened up his abortion tree over there. Poor Sarah came in uh, with child, and this is straight out of Edgar Allan Poe, as well as the other case I'll mention here. Uh, he ends up botching the procedure, killing her in a panic in a hotel in Manchester, takes her, folds her up, puts her in a suitcase, packs her on a train, ships her to Boston, and tries to sell her a corpse to, uh, to a local medical school down there. The authorities in Boston get concerned. He comes back to Manchester, grabs his stuff, gets on the train, comes back to Vermont, refuses to respond. I love this. New Hampshire sends over the cops. They grab him, physically grab him, and drag him back to New Hampshire without any extradition. They just take him back to Manchester. He appears at a hearing uh, on the charge of murdering Sarah. 
Uh, he's released, went back to Vermont. That's the end of the case. He never, he's never held a comp before. The other one is a, an incredible case of William Howard in 1857 was a, an Englishman with an Irish brogue who came over and um, suckered a lot of people into believing that he was the Queen's physician and he's, he had a business in uh, Burlington and he moved over to the uh, Connecticut River area. He became suspect in three additional deaths. I'm sorry, he killed four young ladies, including his wife, by botched abortions. Uh, three additional deaths. Uh, when they went in and looked in his office, he had seven fetuses preserved in glass uh, jars. He committed two rapes. He attempted a murder. And uh, when 19-year-old Olive Ash came to him, not knowing about all of this, uh, he ended up uh, killing her, too, and shipping her back home after she died in to, North, to the Northeast Kingdom. He ended up having a trial. He was sentenced to two years of hard labor in the... Uh, state prison and a fine of $10. That's just how serious uh, such an egregious case was taken. So what about the medical profession itself? Here's a gentleman from the University of Vermont. Yeah, this is an amazing situation, the, the state of a medical profession in Vermont, Yeah, because I don't know of any other states that experience this. Other states shared the fact that there were the uh, uh, the so-called rationalists, the educated doctors that were practicing, but they were up against the, the so-called empiricists, or the quacks, the botanical doctors, the water doctors, uh, the natural uh, treatment doctors. So it's the educated that want to use opium, it's the uh, empiricists, quacks that uh, want to rely strictly on natural remedies and don't have the training. And this becomes important in Vermont for really weird in a really kind of strange trajectory here. In 1820, there was a law to license doctors to be responsible. The Vermont Supreme Court issued these licenses to the doctors. But then that upset the population so much, saying, who do these doctors think they are that they can tell us that we can only go to them? We want to be able to go to the botanical doctors, the alternative doctors. How can you set aside licensing for educated and not set aside special provisions on the behalf of the botanicals. They called these, this is an elitist move. The licensed doctors had a monopoly on health care in Vermont. And so um, in 1838, the Supreme Court or the legislature caved and they took, took away licensing requirements. We had no licensing from 1838 until 1878. So we have Four decades of the Wild West in the medical field, where nobody is able to oversee these doctors. There were no laws stopping them. I mean, if you commit murder while on abortion or whatever, you're going you're to uh, stand for or have to uh, face those charges. By 1890, there were at least uh, eight, estimated 86 unlicensed doctors here in Vermont that were practicing, and we had. Not one, two, three, but four diploma mills around the state that were pumping them out with the bogus uh, uh, graduation certificates. So the other thing to consider is, what do the doctors do? How do doctors get drugs to their patients? How do they treat them? And these are some tools that are up at the University of Vermont. They've got scales for weighing things out. You see the doctors would go to the local general store and buy an opium in quantity or some other thing. Take it back to their office. They would cut it up. Uh, they would make tinctures out of it. They'd use alcohol. Uh, they'd put things in paper folds. They'd put it on their saddlebags in the center there. Uh, here are a number of drugs that they've got uh, in another carrying case there. You see the bottles that they carried in their wagons and maybe not horses for that, but. Uh, this is the kind of thing that the doctors carried around. And then they carried these syringes, too. Those were invented in 1853 in Scotland. And after, after that point, it became a very, uh, widely available for people to own. You had your own personal package. You could, you could go buy a syringe and you could administer drugs to yourselves. So the doctors were uh, going to the various general stores. And here's just a representative of uh, 
some of the uh, stores that were selling drugs around Vermont. And the, uh, the drug trade is growing also. And so what the next confrontation to take place here is doctors not only fighting amongst themselves, they're fighting with the druggists also. Because the druggists are also uh, diagnosing and prescribing on their own. There's nothing says they can't. There's no laws against it. So they're doing that. They're taking away the work from the doctors. That's making them angry. Um, Vermont also was home to probably perhaps one of the largest drug manufacturing uh, businesses in Burlington, Wells Richardson. This is very persuasive, or, or pervasive. And uh, this is just a photo of it. So the drug trade was very, um, very huge. And in order to start to alleviate some of the fighting between doctors and druggists, they arranged for kickbacks. If a doctor would recommend a client, a, a patient, to come to them to fill their, their drug prescription, they'd get a kickback to the doctor. And to make sure that you went to the, doc, to, the, to the pharmacist that the doctor wanted to, he'd write it in code so that only that particular pharmacist would, pharmacist would understand what the prescription was. This is how this, is how this worked. There was also arguments with the patient. Who owns the prescription? The patient, the pharmacist, or the doctor? Who gets to dictate when you can fill it? You know, patients are arguing, I've got this prescription, and you know, five years later, he wants to fill it again, and then he wants to fill it again and again. And so these are things that are having to be worked out. By 1866, uh, the Royal Medical Society is beginning to take um, take notice. And the president, vice president at that time, he notes that he talks about one particular family that over 20 years they had used 3,000 bottles of um, these patent medicines. They were destitute. They could hardly eat. They could hardly clothe themselves. And uh, he brought that as an example. But that didn't stop some of the, some of the public. Uh, Welcome Wilson started growing opium, and uh, this was his scam, sending out brochures with regard to uh, getting people to latch on to his system to grow opium. Vermont was producing so much opium and shipping it to Massachusetts. Mass was having trouble uh, controlling the problem down there. They're saying, Vermont, stop. <laughs> We're getting so much of your drugs down here. Uh, over the last half of the uh, century, opium imports increased three times faster than the growth of the nation's population. So that's naturally going to bring on things like addiction. And we just had it starting with children, as I mentioned, with, uh, with alcohol and drugs. The syringe made things easier to, to, uh, to have access to drugs. Good old Dr. William Russell in Middlebury, here's his existing uh, ledger showing all the sales of opium that he made to, uh, to people. People just would come in and you'd write down the name and, and, because there's no law that says you can't, so they did it. But they sold, and they sold a lot of it. Until things start to get serious, and I love this man, Dr. Carlton Pennington Frosch, uh, just, just a wonderful man. He was a, uh, an expert witness in the, uh, the Howard murder. Um, he, the one that killed the, the uh, British doctor, so-called doctor. He was an expert witness uh, called by the prosecution, and clearly he was a Civil War soldier. Um, in 1870, he was so highly thought of, he, he lived in the um, Hanover area, and he was on the um, faculty at, at the Dartmouth. And he wrote a, uh, the first, sounds of first alarms, in a document called Opium, Its Uses and Abuses. And he says, we can satisfy ourselves by very limited investigation that the amount of opium prescribed by medical practitioners for the cure of disease, large as it is for this purpose, constitutes a small proportion of the amount consumed in the communities of our own state. And he notes that it is generally used without the knowledge of many persons outside the family of the user, unless the amount required becomes pretty large and the effect is plainly marked. So this is a very quietly engaged in course of conduct that people are doing. And that's why, you know, another reason why temperance is, the temperance movement's not 
heavily involved with it. And he also said he, that he knows that there are people who will deprive themselves of the absolute necess necessaries of life, and that he noted that most of them take them in the form of morphine, and, and they take it by mouth. Essentially, uh, using morphine and opium, if you could find any kind of a mucous membrane on your body, you can rub it on it, and, including on the cuticles. They talked about having done that. Uh, in 1871, uh, the Vermont Pharmacy Association passes its code of ethics, and it says that if any of our people know folks coming in abusing these drugs, they should discourage the practice. So that's as far as the pharmacists were going. Being fans of Vermont history, you've all seen the steamship Champlain. You know why I went ashore like that? You probably don't. It was driven up on the rocks on the night of July 16, 1875, with 80 passengers, with the 58-year-old uh, pilot John Eldridge, high on morphine. He said he was taking it for gout, but. <laughs> He wasn't driving in a straight line. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he ruined the shame playing. It was trash. Okay, so the Temperance Union is the only real organized organization. I mean, the medical people are starting to get attention. The Christian Temperance Union is uh, getting atten giving more and more attention to it. And they have uh, different sections within the temperance societies. There's a hygiene section. In 1882, they added uh, to the hygiene section that women pay attention to the effects of stimulants and narcotics upon the human system. It's the first in the U.S. to do that, to add narcotics committees uh, within the temperance movement. 1884, the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union in Burlington offered $50 in prizes to, to high school, high and grammar school students for essays having to do with these evil, evil effects of stimulants and narcotics. So it's in the schools now. We're, we're recruiting the kids to... What year? Uh, that's 1884. And then Vermont is involved in the first book uh, to uh, educate children about drugs, and that's what you see here on the right, um, dealing with physiology, hygiene, and narcotics. What year? I'm year, sorry? Year. Uh, the year? Yeah. Right about that same time. Same time. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't have the exact point. 1890, I, I won't belabor uh, these, these quotes. A wonderful doctor in Virginia wrote a paper called The Promiscuous Use of Opium in Vermont. And he gives a snapshot of uh, what he witnessed there in Virginia. I have seen five victims of this habit enter a drug shop in Virginia and purchase what opium and morphine they desire within less than two hours time and no questions were asked. And then he turns it on the doctors and he says, it seems to me that as our duty as guardians of the public health and as members of this society to do all in our power to influence the passage of a law to mitigate the evil. So now we're starting to generate interest within the uh, medical profession to do this. If you went to the, uh, this is a great glass plate in the, in the state archives at the Vermont State Hospital. Here's a patient, and I can't tell you, I think it was cocaine, but he's all broken out with rashes and blotches and what have you up and down his left side there. So the, it, it is a problem, um, it's visible and uh, causing families to be so concerned that they, even though they don't have societal um, things to fall back on to help them with it, they end up going to probate court and you get a probate order to uh, take this person into state custody, essentially, and ship them off to the state hospital if you're not able to get people to willingly deal with their, their addictions. Gary, I just wanted to let you know we're running out of time, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I know people will have questions, so yep. you can wrap it up. I will. Thank you. Uh, to deal with the addiction, uh, Leslie Keeley from uh, Indiana comes in and he sets up the Keeley Institute of in Montpelier. These are his... Uh, one of his uh, brochures. And then finally, in 1900, Dr. Uh, Ashbel Grinnell at the University of Vermont rings a very large bell, and he creates this document, Use and Abuse of Drugs. And uh, he estimates 
uh, because of surveys that he did with suppliers, manufacturers, wholesalers, that there was so many drugs, so much op opium being sold, and he says, I have never been so astonished or amazed, and he estimated there were 3.3 million doses given to uh, every man, woman, and child in Vermont every year. Well, I'm sorry, 3.3 3 million doses a month to every man, woman, and child in Vermont. But this works out to, for one and a half doses for a year, it comes to about uh, six grains daily, or uh, three aspirin of uh, aspirin-sized quantities of opium. So there's, we're starting to get attention nationally. Um, the national, uh, the Congress is passing a law to deal with the importation of opium. 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act are passed to force manufacturers to disclose what's in these bottles they're selling. This is for uh, Chittenden County prosecutor, also Vermont Congressman David Foster, who drafted the first drug law in the country. That took place in uh, 1910. Finally, 1915, Vermont gets on board, and uh, here's Vermont's first uh, drug law. And then uh, most recently, <coughs> You won't recognize that. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a you, you probably saw that. It was 10 years or so ago. I got, got a lot of publicity. Yeah. Okay, uh, that is my presentation. Wow. Uh, about as long as I can. Yes, ma'am. I was curious that. There wasn't mention of um, midwives yeah. and their role in both, you know, in, in providing mm -hmm. um, family planning. Yes, there were. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, was that, that was not inciting your data, like were midwives less likely to, to be part of the, the data like what, where, what's their place in, in this? They, they occupied a unique position. I mean, they were neither trained like the medical doctors. A lot of them were like the botanical, they followed the botanical doctors and believed in non-use uh, of drugs, that kind of thing, natural childbirth. But yeah, they were involved, but as far as them giving opium and things like that, I don't, I'm not aware of Well, I mean, that. in terms of um, uh, providing abortions, I would have thought that... They, they were. They were involved in doing that. And, and there was a scale. I mean, professional doctors that wanted to have a good reputation did not engage in it, but there were the lesser educated doctors that did do that, and that happened throughout the 1800s. And so when was there... Or was there a shift from women going to midwives to women going to doctors? I can't give you a date on, on that. I'm sh I think the, the mid midwifery was around for some time. It wasn't right. anything new in the 1800s. Right. But I guess I, like I could see people, I could, well, he's, he is a doctor, so, you know, I, I was just wondering where midwives stood in that. If, if you're going to give birth, you're going to search out, I mean, you, it's going to be natural at home, or you call in a doctor, or a midwife, mm -hmm. or, or a neighbor, or whatever. Depending upon probably I mean, are, your rural or yeah, city. Yeah, right, or, right. Um, I wrote a history of Coca-Cola, which was a patent medicine meant to oh, really? cure Good. neurasthenia. And the, the guy who invented it was addicted to uh, morphine and was interested in cocaine, which was in Coca-Cola, as a way to get him off of morphine. Mm -hmm. But he was also, uh, uh, he was a botanical <coughs> doctor. And so I ended up looking at this, and, and a lot of the doctors were killing more people than the root doctors were because they were bleeding them and they were uh, putting suction things on them to, to... Bleeding was falling out of favor by the late 1800s. 
Yeah, but yeah, he was. So that's when they were beginning to do more. Uh, it's uh, a very dynamic profession. There are a lot of people coming in and out of it, and yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's lots of levels to everything I talked about here. I just didn't have time. Cocaine became this huge thing right. in the 1880s uh, as yep. a way to get yep. off. Yeah, and there were there were reports of cocaine uses in main logging camps. Yeah. And, and I'm sure it was happening here in Vermont also. Yeah. I just have a cultural question. I'm comparing what was going on with abortions back in that time, of the mm -hmm. early 1800s, and where we're at today. Was there a stigma to having an abortion earlier on? I mean, it was, it was people knew that these things took place. I mean, it, it was like drugs. He didn't but necessarily it, talk about it, but, yeah. but it, it did become known. It wasn't like, known. you know, oh God, forbid you should have an abortion, or was it more accepted? I guess I'm, you don't I can't it. answer that specifically. Okay. I'm sure the neighbors that knew of the difficulties that somebody had and in, in the decisions of making getting an abortion, well, would we have a compassion and outlook towards them, and there are others that wouldn't. Yeah. Yes, sir? Was there much in the way of uh, marijuana being used? And uh, I don't know. I came in a few minutes late, so you may have mentioned it earlier. But. Yeah, um, I think the earliest I remember marijuana was coming up in the around the 1880s or so, 1890s. Mm -hmm. They were used. Probably was before then. But as I said, these these are things that you don't necessarily broadcast that you're using or that you're that you're doing. These are like quiet. And that's why I didn't draw the attention of temperance people. I see. Like the distilled drug uh, alcohol did, yes ma'am? So with all these very high numbers, for any decade or any time period, do you have any idea of the percentage of the population, adults or children that were using them? No, I just know that the, the Vermont them, Medical Society said it was an awful lot of people. Yeah. And uh, Grinnell's finding, he was just shocked. Wait, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't assign a reason for them doing it or where it is they were doing it. So it was just a very quiet habit that a lot of people yeah. had. Yeah. And you know, you had to you get opium gum. A farmer could chew opium gum all day and work out in the fields. You get a syringe, you can. You can like, have access to opium or morphine, and you can shoot yourself up. Lots of stories. The newspapers have lots of stories. And you said you thought opium wasn't really so terrible for you. It was morphine that was really awful. What about it? I'm sorry? Didn't you say that opium wasn't really terrible for you because it was more of a natural product? That was when they made it into morphine? That it was well, I meant in the, in the sense that it, it didn't cause the kind of commotion that the still adulterated distilled alcohol did. So, yeah, I mean, it was it had an effect, but it was not so noteworthy that it angered society that people were using opium. But it did anger them that they couldn't get their sleep at night because of the uh, drunken people on, on distilled alcohol. Right. Yes, sir? So uh, I think um, a big part of the story here is, and you kind of mentioned, is the background, is the professionalization of the medical field in this mm -hmm. country, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think in a lot of ways explains, like, the 1880s, why, was, you know, the term doctors start using the term doctor for themselves. They stole it from academics, by the way. Um, and, um, and, like, in, in terms of wearing lab coats, and there's, like, legitimate doctors who went to school, as opposed to, before that, right, it was, as you kind of talk about, very amateurish. Um, but I'm kind of interested in how, like, um, like alcoholism, like people didn't use that term, like, oh, he's an alcoholic. I think the term was around maybe in the late 19th century, but I don't think it was really accepted I until the. Right. Yeah, I don't think it was like, like, like as a medical designation was not accepted until like the mid 20th century. I know like the uh, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous actually went to Norwich in the 1920s. Um, university uh, here in Vermont. Um, so I'm wondering, because the, how they conceived it was that if you use alcohol too much, it's a, it's a moral fa failure, perhaps more than like a medical mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if um, you saw that as well with like the people, the, like the morphine uh, uh, addicted probably of uh, steamboat driver or, or those things were applied as well, or they, they use, because the term addiction is in the title, but I don't 
know if they conceived of that concept in a medical sense in the way that we do, or is that something that you did see on well, your research? This is all new to them. People were finally there. Addiction has been around for a while. They wrote about it in the 1700s, 16, 1700s, to be an addict. But you didn't see the term addict or addiction in the literature, which may explain one reason why it's kind of flatlined. Do they conceive it, though, as like a moral failing? Or as yeah. we would maybe see it now as more of like a, a medical condition? Right? So that person drinks too much because they're No, no. It was, a, it, was a more, it was definitely a moral failing. And you read yeah. the, uh, the, the uh, notes by... Uh, Dartmouth physicians themselves, they were talking about how this is a moral decision that the person has made. Do not get involved with it. Uh, and they specifically recommended that, that no doctors help an addict, said send them off to the family, send them off to a court, but keep the profession out of dealing with his moral failing. So they didn't see it as a medical condition. But you saw the transition to Keeley's, uh, yeah. you know, the addiction treatments. I think then you're starting to see people recognize it as a medical issue. Yes, sir. Was laudanum highly uh, oh, yeah, laudanum? used then? Yeah. Yeah, you mix laudanum with a lot of things. Laudanum was used as far back as the revolution and the War of 1812. I, I've read medical accounts that uh, surgeons were using it when they could mm -hmm. get it. Um, it wasn't always available. I want to thank everybody for coming. Gary's going to be here. He has books. We also have one of Gary's book in the bookstore called The Rebel and the Tory, which is a fascinating book about, about Ethan Allen and Philip Skeen. Is it Skeen? Yeah, Skeen. Yeah. yeah um, Skeen. Who was a, across the lake. Uh, Everybody's heard of Skeensboro. Right? Skeensboro. <laughs> and, uh, but thank you, Gary, and um, really appreciate it.